I started playing tennis very diligently before an accident put a pause to a career that didn't quite take off. Now, I truly believe I was talented. I had a great serve and a mean forehand, but to be completely honest, I probably did not have the drive to succeed or even the right system in place to support my interest. Now, tennis is not a sport that you can just go and play if you felt like one day, like cricket or football or even badminton. We grew up as kids playing these sports in our parks, the schoolyards, the maidans or the open grounds, even in front of our apartment buildings. I remember a lot of my neighbours just buying a few badminton rackets and a net and that's it, the inter-apartment badminton tournament was a go. So there is a simpler feasibility that cannot happen when it comes to few sporting disciplines like tennis. Some in India clearly did have that drive. Legends like Amrit Raj and Krishnans, who were the trail blazers, the first to lead the way. Then of course came a pair who put India firmly on the global stage, Leander Pace and Mahesh Bhupati. Then of course a champion whom we know was made of a lot of sweat and toil, Sanya Mirza. And we can't forget to mention someone like Rohan Bupana, who's still going strong and will feature in the Asian Games in a few days. A few others who have shown promise, like Somdev Devarman, who managed to reach a career-high singles ranking of 62. That's incredible. But why have there been very few and far in between? Why is it so difficult to produce champions? Probably one glaring reason is what India's current high, highest ranked men's singles tennis player Sumit Nagal just came out saying, and I quote, If I look at my bank balance, I have what I had at the beginning of the year. It is 900 euros, approximately 80,000 rupees. I feel like I'm lacking support, despite being India's number one player for the past few years. We lack funding, we lack the system. If there is a system, there will be funding. We are 1.4 billion, why do we not make it to a high level? The guidance is missing in tennis. We are far away from competing at the top. I, feel, I felt when my ranking dropped after injury, no one wanted to help me. No one believed that I could be back. That was disappointing because I feel whatever I do is not enough. It's so hard to find financial support in India. To be honest, I do not know what to do. I have given up. And tennis is the most expensive sport to play or take up, even as a hobby and more so professionally. Let's compare just the racket sports and let me show you what the rackets alone cost. Now, badminton, for example, and before we go ahead and tell you all the numbers, these are numbers of some of the best brands across all racket sports. These are the best brands like Lee Ling or Wilson or Babolat. In badminton, the best rackets you see anywhere would cost you between 4,000 to 8,000 Indian rupees. That's around 100, the range reaching to $100. Table tennis, for example, the best brands will cost you anywhere between 3,000 to 5,000 rupees. That's again, close to 36, between 36 to $60. Squash, again, slightly higher than the other two sports. Again, will cost you anywhere between 4,000 to 12,000 Indian rupees. That's reaching to $144. And finally, tennis. You wouldn't guess. Somewhere between 20,000 to 45,000. The best rackets for a professional. And then of course comes the gutting. You have to spend to keep the racket in good shape. And this is just as far as the racket alone goes. Tennis balls are expensive. You need lots to play and you need a facility, a proper court to play in. And this is just at junior level. I spoke to the man who created one of the top champions in the world, Sanya Mirza's father, Imran Mirza. Says that at the junior level itself, Sanya at that point needed at least 50 lakhs a year. He says at the professional level, to make some decent amount of money, you simply have to break into the top 100. That means playing Grand Slams, and that means even a first round appearance, which would get you decent amount of money to tide you. But the toughest road is to break into that top 100. And for that, you have to play enough of tournaments on the world circuit and for that you have to travel now the tennis calendar is such that it has different inter tier level tournaments the 250 the 500 the thousand which is more expensive to enter which means more points you make and more the earnings now imran says you have to travel choose the cheaper venues but also ones where there will be good exposure on winning which means a lot of money in fact, he says that the travel alone is the most expensive part for the athlete because any pro has to travel with at least a team of three, trainer, coach, physio, which again involves money. He also says he saved quite a bit up by doubling up as family and coach for Sanya. It does take a village to not only raise a child, but a tennis champion as well. It's a sentiment that has been voiced 
by Novak Djokovic as well, earlier this year. He said, and I quote, 1.3 billion people watch it, the sport. Thousands, tens of thousands of players compete worldwide. And yet only 400 people, men and women, can make a living out of this sport. I think we have to put that in our mind and really think about whether this sport is doing great or not. And tennis is also a sport where even if you are the number one in your country, you still have to fund yourself and get your sponsors. Badminton, for example, the travel for the different BWF tours around the world. For the top 20 in the country are funded by SAI, which is the Sports Authority of India, and BAI, the Badminton Association of India. Not so for tennis. Now joining me in the Mic Up segment today is some, someone who I've actually played tennis with. Somdev Dev Varman, he started tennis in Chennai, moved to play US collegiate tennis, rose up the ranks and reached a career high singles ranking of 62. And that was incredible. He's of course a commentator now. And uh, thank you so much then for joining us here on First Sports Som. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Rupa. Uh, so the first question, obviously, you know, going by what we are talking about here today, the first question I have to ask you is, tell us a bit about your journey. How difficult is it, you know, from a personal point of view, to establish yourself in a sport like tennis, it's not so easy. How difficult has that journey been, especially in a country like India? Well, it was. Um, it was incredibly hard. You know it as well. I mean, the junior circuit is, I mean, not the easiest place to kind of make that breakthrough, but it doesn't get any easier as you kind of take, uh, take steps forward. It only gets harder. Uh, and I think that's true with every sport. Uh, so, yes, I, I, I mean, it was incredibly hard. I found a, a number of different sort of challenges. Uh, one is obviously the training, the guidance, the coaching. Uh, you know, what were the logical next steps to take? How do you kind of plan a career out, let alone plan a season out? Um, and then how do you, I mean, the, the key question that's underlying at all times in an athlete's life is, you know, what do you need to do now to, get better to improve and uh, make sure you have better performances. So yeah, it was incredibly hard. Of course, along with that, there were financial issues. There were issues because, you know, you're trying to play tennis in a, uh, you're trying to play a global game coming from India. It's not the easiest thing in the world. Uh, but at the end of the day, that's the challenge that most athletes and most sports have. Uh, so I spoke to, um, of course, someone we know very well, Sanya Mirza. I spoke to her father uh, some time back and we also shared a lot of thoughts about this because that's another story which has been again come uh, through a lot of sweat, through a lot of planning. Again, I'm sure, you know, to get where she did, it would have been equally difficult. Difficult, And what he said was, you know, a lot of people, for a lot of them, also Sanya included, the family played a very important role, whether it was Sanya, whether it was Leander, whether it was Mahesh or even Rohan. And for you, you were probably one odd sort of success story that didn't really have that. So what was the thing that made your journey work to the extent that it did? And it was obviously another sort of a very, very uh, prolific career. I mean, yes, I think Imran uncle is right. Family plays a huge part. Uh, it was different for me because I, I think one of the probably uh, something that I really thank my parents for today is the fact that they recognized pretty early on that they were not the experts uh, when it came to when it came to making decisions about tennis, uh, I think they wanted to kind of put me on the right path, uh, and then hopefully at some point I would be mature enough, old enough, or be surrounded by the right people enough that we could start making better decisions to you know for my career, for my profession, whatever it was. Um, so I think yeah, it, it just you know while my dad wasn't a tennis player, he did come from a sporting background, uh, and I think the one thing that I mean. You know, every, every uh, not every, but most success stories in Indian sport at least happen uh, because there's a, a massive support system from the family. The amount of sacrifices that need to be made, uh, you know, it's uh, especially when there's, you know, quite a few kids, there's, there's a lot of, you know, how do you prioritize what's the most important to a 15-year-old uh, and when you have three or four of them. So, you know, it's, uh, it's different challenges, but uh, that being said, my family has been super supportive uh, was super supportive before I started. The, you know, 10s and 12s and 14s, that's a different grind. Then by the time you get to the pros, that's a completely different grind again. Um, and, and, and so they've been nothing but supportive the whole time, but it has been very hard. Uh, would you say moving out of India to 
play abroad and to train abroad was also a very key decision that you made and sort of paid off? Yeah, it was the most important decision because I realized fairly quickly that I felt like I wasn't in the right environment to actually, you know, make that stride that I wanted to make at 18 or 19. Uh, so yes, moving abroad to a country that had a better tennis infrastructure, had a better tennis culture, had a better tournament structure. I was going to be, you know, practicing with better people, playing with better people. And yes, of course, it helped that I was going to get an education there as well. Um, but yeah, it was the most important decision for me to actually find any level of success was to leave the country, uh, not train in India, as sad as that sounds. Um, and the truth is, is that I never really trained in India, even once I turned pro. Uh, I, I recognized that, you know, what was going to be better for me training with Andy Roddick or training with, uh, you know, being the head of, you know, five or six juniors. So I, I did do that later in my life. I did come back. I did, uh, you know, do pre-seasons and whole camps and things like that. But for the bulk of my professional career, the training, it has, it has to happen at uh, better places. Right. And so the story isn't about Sumit Nagal. Of course, that's the starting point. There are so many other athletes across, you know, someone like Novak Djokovic, as well as Roger Federer, who clearly say that, you know, tennis is that sort of a sport where, you know, there's so many who play, there are lakhs and thousands who play, but only about 200 to 400 benefit from something like this. How much of a truth there is to something of this sort? You know, the fact that it is a struggle monetarily, you know, considering a sport like badminton still funds their top 20 players in the country, tennis is a very lonely sport. Tennis is an extremely lo lonely sport. Uh, and yes, I think there's 100% truth to the fact that about four or 500 players max make a, a, a decent living while playing the sport professionally. Um, yes, it's different than badminton. Uh, it's different than squash. It's different than track and field. Uh, because in those sports, I'd say it's probably less. Um, if you're just looking at on-court earnings alone, the opportunities for on-court earnings. So, you know, it's not football, it's not cricket, it's not any of the ma ma major sports in America where there's, you know, tons of athletes or the English Premier League. It's, uh, it's a very isolated sport where there's no guaranteed money and, uh, and it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It's incredibly competitive. There's young players coming up from all over the place. So for me, actually, as a country, uh, I, the things that I would focus on, you know, a couple of things. Number one is while we have been left behind, uh, let's figure out why. Let's figure out why Japan is so much better than us in the last decade. Let's figure out why China, I know we don't like to hear it, but look at where the Chinese men were 15 years ago and look at the leaps and bounds they've made and where we are today. It's not, it's just the crux of an athlete is to find places where you can be better. Um, and so for Indian tennis, that's been a reflective a point for reflection for many years, uh, which I think that they've fallen short on. So hopefully we'll be able to look at that and say, okay, all our neighboring countries in Asia are doing much better than us. Why is that? And how do we fix the problem? Uh, so I, I, that's a good point to start usually. Uh, does, it's easier said than done, obviously. Um, and then the second thing is, you know, how do we make sport more accessible? How do more people in villages get it? Um, then, of course, once you kind of, you know, cross those barriers, then then you talk about player development, player coach development, tournament structures. There's so many ways where we are, where we could be so much better, but we're not. Yes, and just uh, one, of course, final thought before we sort of wrap this up with you, Som. Uh, you know, Imran Mirza also said that a couple of things that are huge daunting challenges for any tennis player, one, you know, turning pro, of course, you know, getting into the top 100 is the key. And that's a big struggle. One is, of course, travel, which really drains you financially. And then, of course, how do you spend the little sponsorship that comes, comes through? How do you um, cleverly put it to good use? So a couple of those things also key in the process of getting better and knowing how to man manage finances. It, I, think that's a, I think that's a big part of the problem. Um, is, you know, why would you, let's say, for example, there was a promising 18-year-old or a promising 20-year-old uh, from our country that now suddenly had access to 20 lakhs that they otherwise, you know, he or she would not have had access to before. Why do you think a first-time player would know exactly the right way to use those 20 lakhs, to utilize those funds? Um, so, I mean, that's a very basic question um, the, that, that, you know, those funds need to, but but I do think that there's many organizations that are already doing that job really well, 
uh, OGQ, for example, JSW, for example, uh, Go Sports, for example. I think those guys have really fine-tuned the way of the best way to fund athletes and make sure that they're, you know, making use of uh, the sponsorship money in the best way possible. Uh, in tennis, it's obviously different because it's uh, it's an individual sport. Um, so it's not the easiest thing, which is why at some point you would imagine, you know, Leander, Mahesh, Rohan, who's still playing, of course, Sanya, myself, and there's several other players um, that have experience with this stuff, that have good intentions. And, uh, you know, the at, at least we'd like to see the next generation have the best chance for success. So you would imagine that uh, former players will be called up. They're not. Yes, some, some thoughts to sort of think about and ponder as well for a lot of the associations, the organizations, those in charge to sort of get this uh, um, moving and take this to the next step as we see it. But thank you, Soam, for shedding some light on this and throwing some possible solutions our way as well. As always, a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much, Rupa. Look forward to the next time.